Hey everyone, welcome or welcome back to Inglebard Gaming. A lot of you seem to have liked my every Sega game on a specific platform video, so today I've got another one of those for you. In this video, I'm showing you every official Sega game that was released on the Famicom slash NES. If you're not already in the know, you'd think that there wouldn't have been any Sega games on that platform, but it ended up with a small chunk of them. Thrill as you see NES versions of Sega arcade games that don't compare to the originals. Feel the suspense as I compare one original Sega Master System game to an NES port of it. This video has something for everyone, or at least everyone that wants to see Sega games on 8-bit Nintendo systems. I'm only going to touch on the most basics of the history and tech specs of the NES since it's so well known, unlike many of the computers and systems I've looked at in this series. The Famicom originally hit Japan in July of 1983, and made its way to the West a few years later as the Nintendo Entertainment System. Most of us in the US call it the NES for short. In other places like the UK, they say NES. It's an 8-bit system based on a variation of the MOS 6502, a CPU whose variations also power devices like the Atari 2600, Commodore 64, Apple II, and even the PC Engine slash TurboGrafx-16. Its sprite and color capabilities were certainly of its era, <laughs> meaning they're pretty primitive, but more advanced than pretty much everything that came before it. NES sound is a bit of a standout with five channels, including one dedicated to PCM playback. Nintendo absolutely dominated the 8-bit console scene in Japan, the US, and a few other parts of the world. But they actually lost out in other territories like Europe and Brazil to name a few. Can't win them all, I guess. Anywho, as with the PC Engine slash TurboGrafx-16, the NES was home to a handful of Sega ports and a couple of games I'll call Sega adjacent. A few of the games have significant regional differences between the US and Japanese releases, and in those cases, I'll look at those games separately. Alright, that's enough blathering, let's get on with it. We begin with the NES port of Afterburner, released as an unlicensed title by Tengen. Tengen, Tengen, whatever you like better, just imagine that's the way I'm pronouncing it. So this version of Afterburner obviously pales in comparison to the arcade release, but that's completely to be expected with the vast differences in hardware. And you know what? This is one of the best home ports of Afterburner that was available back in its day. It's vastly superior to Sega's own port on the Master System. This one is fun to play, looks passable for the hardware, and sounds... eh, it sounds kinda okay at best. But you know what? Check this out. This is the Japanese release of Afterburner that was brought to the market by Sunsoft. Sunsoft knew their way around the NES sound chip, and they really spruced up the music and effects. They also touched up the visuals here and there. When looking at the US and Japanese releases, the Japanese version is clearly the superior version of the game. I mean, they even squeezed digitized voices into this one. And I'll also spoil the rest of the video and tell you this is the best game you'll see today, and the most impressive of the NES Sega ports. The only real downsides here are the game is a little dull at times and doesn't have the speed controls of the arcade game or its more advanced home ports. Even though this game is called Afterburner, it really seems to be more based on Afterburner 2 if you look at the stage layouts and the bonus round. Anyway, nice job everyone who made this, you did good. Next we move on to Alien Syndrome. I've already done a full comparison of the arcade and NES versions of this game, which is linked below and uh, up at the top of the screen there somewhere, so I'll keep this section short. NES Alien Syndrome is also pretty good. This is another case where the NES version is superior to the Sega Master System version of the same game. This one was released by Sunsoft in Japan and by Tengen in the US as an unlicensed game. There are only minor regional differences between the Japanese and US versions, so I'm not going to show these games separately this time. Overall, this is a pretty nice port. It's significantly cut down from the arcade game, of course, and considerably slower, but it's still fun to play through, and even includes two-player simultaneous play. Again, nice work, developers! Here's Alter Beast, and wow, it's not good on Famicom. The gameplay takes place in a really small window. The sprites are itty bitty teeny tiny. There's just barely any detail in the backgrounds, it's missing the beast transition screens, it's only one player, etc, etc. This game was brought to the Famicom by Asmic, 
who would later go on to completely ruin Shinobi on the PC Engine. Famicom Altered Beast isn't the worst game I've played, and it isn't even close to being the worst version of Altered Beast, but it just isn't fun. The collision detection is rough, enemy movement patterns are weird, and it just doesn't feel anything like the arcade game. On the positive side, this one has three original levels not present in any other version, along with exclusive beast forms in each of them. Most people out there these days seem to hate Arcade Altered Beast, but if you're one of the few like me who enjoy that version, you may get a kick out of the stuff that's brand new in this one. I don't know if I like this one more or less than the SMS version personally. They're both very flawed ports for very different reasons. This one at least plays slightly better than that one overall, but Master System Altered Beast definitely looks better with its much larger characters and more detailed backgrounds, despite the fact that it's incredibly choppy. Anyway, FC Altered Beast is so-so at best. Next on the agenda, we have the US NES port of Fantasy Zone. It's kind of meh. A lot of things move in a weird way, the colors aren't great, and there aren't a whole lot of enemies around, and this is super, super easy. This one was released in unlicensed form by Tengen yet again. It pales in comparison to the arcade original, as you can see here. The Sega Master System port is also vastly superior to this one. In general, NES Fantasy Zone doesn't look good, it doesn't sound good, and it's not a great port considering the capabilities of the hardware. Even so, it does do a thing or two better than the mostly superior Japanese version, which we'll look at right now. Here's Sunsoft's Japanese Famicom release of Fantasy Zone, and it's an entirely different game. It's better than the Tenken release in just about every way, faltering only in a few places where it has a little more flicker than that version does. It looks, sounds, and plays better overall. And this one is a pretty decent port of the first Fantasy Zone, and definitely the one to play if you want to experience the game on 8-bit Nintendo hardware. Personally, I still prefer the SMS version to this one, but it's really kind of a toss-up when all is said and done. Here's Fantasy Zone 2, The Tears of Opa Opa. It also made its way to the Famicom courtesy of Sunsoft. Now, Fantasy Zone 2 originated on the Sega Master System. There was no arcade version of this game back in the day. But wait, you say? I've looked it up and it says there are two arcade versions, including a System 16 version. So two things here. There was an arcade version that ran on Sega's System E arcade hardware that came out after the original but was really similar due to that system being, well, really similar. Also, there is a System 16 version, but that's because it was ported to the System 16 many, many years after the original Sega Master System version. So in this case, I'm comparing the SMS and Famicom versions of the game since the SMS version was the original release. Famicom Fantasy Zone 2 is fine, it won't turn heads or anything, but it's a competent port. The Famicom version suffers a bit from noticeably fewer colors and less going on at any one time regarding on-screen enemies than the original SMS version, making it a generally easier game to play, and it just feels a bit off gameplay-wise. I'm not the biggest fan of any of the Fantasy Zone games, but it's easy to tell that the original SMS game is superior in every way in this case. But if for some reason you just hate the Sega Master System and everything it stands for, or maybe it murdered your family or something, then yeah, you'll enjoy the Famicom version well enough, I guess. Okay, this one requires some explanation. Puyo Puyo was originally developed by Compile. Years later, Sega purchased the franchise and it belongs to them now, which is why I include it in these videos. This comparison isn't quite apples to apples, so if you want to angrily bash away on your keyboard in the comments, go ahead, knock yourself out. On the Famicom, here we have the original Puyo Puyo. It released at the same time both for the Famicom Disk System and the MSX Computer in Japan. The arcade version I'm showing you here came along a little bit later but is still just called Puyo Puyo and play mechanics wise is still really similar. Puyo Puyo on the Famicom is the earlier title and it certainly shows. It's a lot more primitive and is missing the gameplay refinement that would come with the 16-bit releases. It's still fun enough, and includes the fundamentals of the series. You can still create giant chains through careful planning or sheer luck. 
You can play one player endless mode, a mission mode, which is a puzzle game with specific goals, or player versus player, which includes the clear garbage beans that you send to your opponent that have become a staple of the series. Now, I enjoy the first Puyo Puyo a lot still on the Genesis, the arcade, and the various other systems that it appeared on. The Famicom version of the original Puyo Puyo is okay. It's fun enough to play and interesting for its historical value to see how the series started. As a game to sit down and just enjoy though, despite a lot of its unique elements, this one just doesn't hold up nearly as well as the later releases in the series. It's absolutely worth taking a look at, but even the most die-hard Puyo Puyo fans will want to move on to newer and better versions after just a few minutes. And now, sadly, it's time for Shinobi, which is easily the worst game in this video. NES Shinobi is a bastardized port of the Master System version of Shinobi. It's basically got the arcade stages, enemies, bosses, and stuff, but, I mean... Yeah, just look at the arcade and the NES version side by side here. The NES port is just a glitchy, badly programmed disaster of a game. The visuals stink, the music is just okay, and the gameplay is often completely broken. They also vastly simplified the stage designs, and there is absolutely no vertical scrolling in any of the stages at all. And a few of the stages are just a couple of screens long, it's completely ridiculous. If you're wondering exactly why I refer to the NES version as a bastardized port of the SMS version of the game, allow me to explain. Sega Master System Shinobi added quite a few things to the arcade original. This included a life bar, a whole bunch of ranged weapons, a whole bunch of close range weapons, and various other power-ups and ninja magics that were not in the original game. This unlicensed Tengen release takes most of what was added to the Sega Master System version and ports it over to this one. So you still get power-ups from rescuing kids, you'll have a few different ranged weapons, and different ninja magics. But the thing is, they didn't even bother to bring over everything from the SMS version. For example, on Sega Master System, there's a total of five different stages of long-range weapon power-ups. On the NES, you have three. In the Sega Master System, there's a whole bunch of close-range weapons. On the NES, there are zero. You can still have close-range attacks, but they're only punches and kicks, and you can only do them when you're practically right on top of the enemy. There are also lots of cheap, unavoidable hits when you jump up to the higher plane near enemies in the NES port. Now the crazy thing is, I'm still not sure that this is even the worst version of Shinobi, but it's definitely up there. Or down there, depending on your point of view. Anyway, it stinks. And I only recommend playing this game if you want to laugh at how terrible it is. And side note, if you want to see the whole thing, I'll be showing this game in its entirety in an upcoming episode of Complete Trash. Space Harrier was one of the most impressive arcade games of its day, with its fast, smooth scaling and loads of sprites all over the place on the screen. It was a great time and very easy to enjoy for a few minutes. Takara released a port of Space Harrier for the Famicom in Japan, and, well, it's not good. At all. Everything is super small, there's rarely more than two or three enemies or ground objects on the screen at any one time, and your rate of fire is really slow, and there's pretty much no fun to be had here whatsoever. Visually, it's alright considering the capabilities of the system, I guess. The music in this version is actually pretty close to the Sega Master System port, and it's, I mean, it's just kinda okay. They could have definitely done way more with the Famicom sound chip than they're doing here. I cannot stand this version of Space Harrier. I'd actually rather play the original C64 release than this one. And that one doesn't even have any checkerboard or lines on the floor, but it plays a lot better. Side note for anyone who's getting angry right now, there is a C64 version with lines on the floor, but that came along later and was a regional change. Now while Famicom Space Harrier is faster and smoother than the tile-based SMS version, and has the backgrounds on the horizon that are missing from the 8-bit Sega port, the Sega Master System version is still way better than this one. While Afterburner was pretty impressive, for a Famicom release, Space Harrier is just meh. And it's really too bad seeing that, you know, the developers of Afterburner did quite a good job on that game considering the hardware. As it is, Space Harrier for the Famicom stinks. This is Wonder Boy, and Adventure Island, which is Hudson's NES slash Famicom port of Wonder Boy, with redone graphics and sound. As you can see, the games are otherwise pretty similar. Wonder Boy had a very accurate SMS port back in the day, and, well, 
and also had a pretty accurate NES port if you ignore the cosmetic changes to the visuals and the new soundtrack. You may consider this Sega blasphemy, but I don't like the original Wonder Boy. It's long, it's boring, and many of the levels are way too samey. As for which platform the game is better on, NES or SNS, I'd say this one is pretty much a draw. If arcade accuracy is what you prefer, then the SMS version is the easy choice. But when it comes to the quality of the graphics, sound, and gameplay, both versions are very close. So of all the Sega games that ended up on the NES, this is definitely one of the better ports. Our final game today is a weird one. The arcade game here is Wonder Boy in Monster Land. It was kind of ported to the Famicom in Japan as this title, Sayuki World. Yeah, they sure changed up the aesthetics of this one, and you may think these games are unrelated, but check out this area. Believe me now? Eh, I don't care. The point is, this is indeed a port of Wonder Boy in Monster Land. They just went with a Far East aesthetic, and this is one of the many games to be based on the famous Journey to the West. Personally, I don't like the new graphics, sound, or level layouts that are in this Jalico release. It just feels more generic than the easily identifiable Wonder Boy in Monsterland. It's not bad when it comes to gameplay in general, and if you can read Japanese, you may get a kick out of playing this one and seeing how it varies from Wonder Boy in Monsterland. For me though, I had a rough enough time getting through just a few minutes of it, and over the years I've never been able to stand this game for more than a few minutes, no matter how many times I've tried. This is another one of those games that's interesting to look at for a little bit, but I doubt many people will feel like playing it through to the end. On a semi-related note, Sayuki World 2, which was an original game and not based on a Wonder Boy title, was released on the NES in America as the game Wampum. Alright, so that's it! Every Sega or Sega-adjacent game that made its way to the NES slash Famicom. It's an interesting batch and runs the quality gamut from absolutely awful to meh, to okay, to pretty good. But in the end, you wouldn't get much of a Sega experience on Nintendo's 8-bit system, whether you lived in the US or Japan. When it comes to the question of whether or not the Famicom slash NES ports are better than those on the Sega Master System, I'd say it's about 50-50. Some are better, some aren't. But even that is a bit of a sad state of affairs, as none of them should have been better on NES. Sega really dropped the ball on a few of its SMS arcade ports, especially Alien Syndrome. So what do you think? Have you played or at least seen all of these Sega or Sega-adjacent games on NES before today? Do you like the games on both systems better on NES or SMS? I'd love to hear your opinions in the comments. That'll do it for this video, my retro gaming friends. If you enjoyed the video, please like and share it. If you haven't already, please subscribe and hit that notification bell so you won't miss any of my videos. If you're so inclined, you can support the work I do here on Patreon or Ko-fi. The links are in the description and follow at the end of the video. With that, I'll say thanks for watching, and see me later.